So today I'm here with Mr. Gamola and we're going to talk a little bit about his uh, business career and investments. So if you just want to introduce yourself, however you like. Okay, uh, Bob Gamola. Um, I'm retired about five years now. And what I'll give you is kind of a brief synopsis of what happened between starting work and retiring. Um, started out at, with my education as an engineer, mechanical engineer, and went into a company working with ball and roller bearings. Worked there for four years and it gave me a tremendous uh, variety of uh, machinery that everything that rotates uh big mills little lawn mowers everything in between and uh, at that job i was an engineer i left there and i took my bearing knowledge to an aerospace bearing company which was very different the first company bearings were anti-friction the second ones were more like bushings carbon graphite but all for the aerospace industry and that job lasted a couple of years when a hostile takeover kind of went south and everybody who was hired before the last couple of years were considered you know to be let go and uh i from there went into where the story of where i think i'm going to be talking more about uh really starts to evolve i went into another aerospace company totally away from bearings this was pumps valves this kind of a thing um i'm going to get a little more about my careers but i'm going to introduce inter interrupt that to tell you one thing my trip to get to work in the morning was just over an hour oh, i'd wow. work an eight hour day and then would come home it actually took a little longer than an hour because at that point and i'm coming from the far east side of cleveland uh over back to the west side and uh it was much heavier traffic through the different highways I hadn't been at that too terribly long when I realized for a 40 hour week, I'm driving 20, uh, 25 percent of the time. So another 10 hours. And I thought, what can I do to help myself or to entertain myself uh, during these 10 hours? And so I started listening. In those days, it was all cassettes, um, entertaining stuff. And then I kind of at one point stumbled upon some I call them self-help type of things stuff you i know you're familiar with because we spoke of it tapes on uh stuff like um dale carnegie how to win friends influence people sales psychology type of things um my my interest in self-help really got peaked when i got into uh uh what's that name of that book boy how was that tip of my tongue I gave it copy to oh, Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Very good book. Yeah, that was a very good book. And uh, I have to say that's when things really started to give me another idea of, hey, there's a lot more out there that I don't know that I could learn about. And it will maybe benefit me, maybe not. And since that time, I have, whatever, whenever I had a long commute, mostly to work, I had something playing and I've got a library that's two huge boxes of stuff. Um, I'm not going to name them all, but like Tony Robbins, um, others, I don't remember the psychology of selling, guerrilla selling, starting businesses, you know, investing, these kind of things. Uh, and over the time, hey, you're driving, you know, two, two hours a day doing this stuff. You start to pick up some information. Uh, it was during those years where I first was introduced to a coworker who actually owned stock. I thought that was a rich guy's thing. I had no idea that, you know, the guy on the street could just say, hey, you know. So I said, well, how do you do it? He goes, well, there's a stockbroker you find. And I go, well, who's yours? He tells me this guy out in Elyria, Ohio. I'm still using him to this day. It's crazy. And uh, some of the earlier stocks were back in... Uh, the early 80s like 80 well mid 80 87 i think now going back to my career that job lasted five years i went from that aerospace job to another aerospace job doing much the same thing uh aerospace pumps mostly for aircraft 
craziest career because I was writing proposals for stuff and we won a lot of these proposals for various aircraft. I don't want to talk about them. I don't know if, what confidentiality <laughs> is or isn't anymore Yeah. Uh, and who, who has this stuff. Um, and that job lasted a couple of years. And then when peace kind of breaks out, companies that support military kind of need to lay back on people. And uh, at that point is when I started working in the rubber industry, specifically tire rubber, going down to Akron, Ohio. Here again, a nice long commute. Side note, interesting, that's where I met your dad. That's yeah. how we kind of know each other through his father and I were closer in age uh, and worked there for a number of years. After that, I... What were you doing there? Oh, okay. Uh, three different jobs, actually. Uh, I was hired in as a salesman for the parts and service division. They had these ma massive machines that would test tires to see if they were roadworthy and safe. Uh, and every tire that's manufactured for passenger or truck vehicles has to be tested on this. And so we were selling these machines. Uh, other people were, but I was selling upgrades, repair, repair parts. Um, and I had had that job for three months where the president of the company came to me and goes, I think we're going to need you to travel internationally. Now, I've never been out of the country except for Canada one or two times. I go, really? I'm, I, I don't know if I've got it, what it takes. He goes, oh, I think you do. He goes, I've watched you for three months. I go, okay. Um, four months into the new job uh, and one month into this international sales job, he goes, here's some tickets. You're going to China. I was there for three weeks. Now, I wasn't alone. The boss came with me. And he goes, I'll walk you through this because this is how it works. And introduced me to our agents and all these different people uh, said, OK. And at the end of that trip, and I still remember this. This was September of 1995 because the then Cleveland Indians made it to the playoffs that month. And I was in China for three of those weeks. I was home for all of October during the whole World Series. And November, the boss said, Another company in China wants you to buy to, to buy some machines from you. And so I was out there from the 1st of November, right be, the day before Thanksgiving, came home with another bunch of machine sales, which is, it's a whole different thing when you're negotiating with other countries. Um, three weeks is a minimum because they are in no hurry and they are expert negotiators. And the first thing they'll ask you within a day or so is, when is your flight back? And if you say, well, I've got a flight to take me home in 10 days, they know their, their best price is going to be on the ninth and a half day. <laughs> and so when you're getting on that airplane and you've just went, spent, you know, 10 or nine days in a, another country with all the expenses, the hotels and food, they figure that you're going to cut the lowest rock bottom price before you get on that plane without a sale. So the boss tells me, he goes, here's what you do. You say, well, I'm going to go 10 days, but I can change it and stay as long as you'd like. And they took advantage of that at each time. It was three weeks. Um, got home right before Thanksgiving. Funny story. Third or fourth of December, another company wants me. Okay, again, three months or three weeks into December, I get home Christmas Eve. And that one ended up a little weird because we didn't make the sale but it came a couple of months later. So it was weird. So I was telling my wife, I said, I've worked for this company now for six months and three of these months I've been out of the country because I'm, I'm traveling so much and it was funny. Um, loved working in China and this was back in the mid nineties. So a lot was different back then. Um, from that job in knowing about the tire industry, you kind of just know the rubber industry because the tires are just a, such a consumer of the rubber. Um, I then had been working for a machine rebuilder out of Akron uh, that mixes and mills rubber. What that means is it takes raw components, puts them together in extremely heavy duty machines. Uh, when it's done blending, and I'm skipping a lot of steps, it comes out as rubber. And that job lasted a couple of years when one of the companies that that company I was working for was repping asked if they wanted 
we our company at that point no longer wanted to rep them but i really liked the product they were making a machine and so i left that uh mixer and mill rebuilding company started my own company and that's where i finished my career out i learned how to what these machines did how to operate them and how to sell them and i was selling them my market now wasn't all around the world it was just north america uh some into canada some into mexico but mostly u.s uh and that's that and that's what i retired from another side note your mom worked for me for the last probably three or four or five years of that before it before i retired so another family tie there yeah so yeah. i guess what um what made you want to you know start your own business and sort of venture out onto that versus working for someone else okay um it was kind of a two-part thing up until that point and if you kind of followed in the story i've had like five job changes one of those was my call four of those were hostile takeovers that went bad or something changed or broke war broke out or peace broke out and i thought you know I'm still kind of young. I'm going to have, you know, 15 more years of work in me. I'd like something with a little job security. And a good friend of mine who I was working with prior to this company uh, said, well, let's start a new company. So we contacted the principal who was a company making this machinery out of the United Kingdom. Uh, we started the company. And that friend of mine was all already wise down that road of what you need to do to start up this kind of corporation and set up these kind of things and get a payroll and you don't need accountants if you can hire a accounting firm and where to get a building and how to do this and all these things and for two years we were together working on this thing and an interesting thing happened um the business just didn't go and we were all making bunches of money uh it went and it was like this for two years um, it wasn't even lucrative enough for both of us to take any kind of a paycheck out of it. So he kind of became more of a silent partner and I kind of took over the day to day business. And after two years, I go, I think I'd rather just do this alone. I've had a couple of years under my skin, uh, to know what's coming, what's going. Um, I can take it from here and we came to an agreement. I gave him a buyout and he said, okay, that's fine. And uh, at that point, it was me in an empty building, sitting here in Ohio, selling this guy's machines, and nobody in the world knew I existed who I hadn't talked to in the prior two years. So I knew at that point, I have got to make myself out there to really, to really see what's going on. Um, it, it came. I, it was slow, being a one-man person, one-man show. But uh, as it came along, it started to grow better and better and when i can i don't know if i've coined this phrase but i've heard it someone when you when the business becomes organic when you've got enough residual business and follow up and some referral and then some side business of service or some guy repair business it started to grow upon itself and at that point that's when i needed some help and got you know your family your mom involved and was bringing over service technicians every month or two months for a two or three week run all over the country to fix machines and and make these sales um it it became quite nice it really was uh there was a couple of times in there where it wasn't quite nice it was it was lean years and it was tough tough years but we hung in there and and i remember now going back to some of these books we referenced uh sometimes people who are on these ventures are very close to succeeding before they either break through and succeed or they throw in the towel and say enough um i can't remember if it was napoleon hill talking about the man who was three feet away from gold uh in a gold mine he bought and he sold it and the guy he sold it to understood vein technology and all this other stuff and you know he said i quit three feet from gold he goes i'm never going to quit again well that's kind of what was driving me on okay i know i can make this i know people need this machine and when i finally got through that big hurdle the rest just started to grow on itself it was quite something uh the one thing i thought was pretty interesting you were saying at the beginning uh, of that little section was 
about like job security like most people would think of uh like owning your own business as less of a secure job because you have to sort of like everything's on you whereas if he works for someone else that seems more of a secure job i, I think that's a very interesting mindset um i looked upon it more or less when I, I had been through companies when when peace broke out and they were supplying a lot of military stuff they didn't need people and they said you're gone i knew i would never lay myself off i knew i also would work for no pay and i couldn't do that at other companies they can't say well we're having tough times so we're not going to pay you i go um what yeah so the security I had was knowing I was not going to ever get laid off. And I had faith in myself. I really did. I knew I was going to make it successful. Um, and I pushed and shoved. And it, it, it was successful for a lot of reasons. If I can backtrack, I can say this other thing too. Um, I am married. And one of the biggest influencers on a successful situation is to have a spouse who understands this and you're in sync with what money's coming in and what money's being spent. Um, I see this in a lot of people, and I'm not gonna get real specific, but family members and extended family members who are who know what they're doing. They're, they, they know what their job is. They know what their income is. They live within it. And their whole thing is growing and it's it's very very satisfying when you retire knowing that you're pretty well decent set okay i guess something else to be a little bit interesting i think is sort of what um what sort of you found the difference of in being sort of your own boss versus kind of working for someone else and um i guess just what you found different in that and whether you liked it or Okay, uh, that's a very good question. And sometimes when people hear that you're your own boss, they say, wow, it must be really great. You don't work for anybody. It's the exact opposite. You work for every customer you've ever sold to or ever will sell to. That phone rings at 445 on a Friday afternoon and somebody's machine just went down. That's where you know you got a boss you got to take care of that and that, that that happens and um if you're the kind of person who thinks well you know i'll just catch this monday your situation's probably not going to be as successful as others who are just going to say okay challenge accepted how do we get whatever we need to get to improve this problem that kind of brings up another thing, and that is when I got into the sales of this machine, it's because I understood it and I knew it solved people's problems. They needed to do something, and I had an, a way of helping them get that handled in an extremely efficient and economic way. The orders came naturally because you were doing that. I can't remember if it was Zig Ziglar or somebody, but they said last year and in North America, I'll just pull a number out. We sold 10 million quarter inch drill bits and nobody wanted a quarter inch drill bit. They wanted a quarter inch hole. So that was a solution that they needed. Nobody wanted my machine, but they wanted to mold something in rubber where it was very economical and not wasteful so they can maximize their profits. And without getting into all the technology, it was like a big Play-Doh fun factory when it comes out and cuts off. That piece coming off goes into a mold, and you want it to fill it without overfilling it and certainly not underfilling it. So you're holding a real tight tolerance. And uh, the machines are excellent. Over those years of working, I have been in so many rubber plants from end to end of this country and helped many, many of them improve their product, improve their productivity, um, sometimes doubling capacity or not requiring a second shift or maybe adding a second machine because it's becoming so profitable. And uh, it's uh, 
it's good being a problem solver. So all yeah. you all you guys out there, gals out there listening and watching, um, who knows what you're going to do? I, I didn't know what I was going to do when I first started out. But if there's a situation, you go, there's a thing happening out there that people could benefit from this solution. And if you have that or you can work it out, you can you can be very it can be very lucrative it could be quite successful yeah that makes sense what uh did you find it i guess did you find it challenging um in the sort of marketing aspect because that seems i guess for me i feel like i'm not someone with a lot of like more soft skills per se so i feel like marketing would be like something difficult and um, kind of getting yourself out there to potential customers. So, um, I think I like you, I am like you in that regard. I knew what marketing was, what I thought. Um, I knew advertising it at some of those previous jobs. I was involved with that. Um, one of the problems my personal self has and why my company only had me and another employee for the most part, and then I'd hire some other people as needed. Um, I have to have my hands on everything. I don't delegate well. So I didn't want to have something where I've got an ad advertising agent with a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar a year budget to put my name out there and another group of people to do this and some subcontract people. I didn't want to have to manage people, people. I understood the technical product and I ran with that more so. And as a result, my company, although it grew, it did not grow as it could have with somebody with real marketing chops, somebody who really knows what's what it takes to take advantage of what you have. Um, I didn't watch the thing, but I saw your post of a few weeks ago or days ago about our CEOs, you know, are they valuable? I should have watched that. I didn't, but I will later. Um, what you need, if you want to have a good and successful company, and you can be a people person where you like to manage and delegate, is you get the right people to do those things for you. And where my my business grew from, you know, nothing up to what it was when I retired, uh, it could have been much, much, much more. It could have been much bigger with people, much bigger with employees, much bigger with turnover, with sales. Um, I didn't have that comfort level to do that. Now, subsequent, the company um, that I was repping from the United Kingdom has now taken over that, what I had started from nothing in the United States, and they're actually doing much better than I ever did because they have the whole corporation behind them and they can bring people over here to sell and they can bring other people over here uh for the servicing and whatnot they've okay. done very well yeah what do you i guess sort of on that tangent of uh ceos what do you look for i guess in a leader uh to be a successful or what do you find is makes a successful leader i'm gonna rely on some of the past CEOs and presidents of companies that I've worked for and they've been this to this they've been they've been from the greatest to, to some that were you know not so good um, in no particular order it's very important in my opinion that they be approachable now maybe not always available but if you needed them they are not going to put the fear of God in you for asking for an audience. Um, at the same time, when I was working at that one company in Akron for three months where they said you could go into international sales, that was the president of the company who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And he was right. After that first trip, I was on my own. I was running over to China. I was there on two trips after that. And I was all of a sudden the China expert in our company. And I go, uh, I get it. I don't know. I mean, I, I know what I'm doing. And they had another division of our company. And the fellow needed to get over there to sell 
some product to a totally different market in China, and they had me go with him. And that's, that was, it was kind of, kind of nice. I mean, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's how you get in and out of the country. You know, there's visas that you wait, situations you got to get in and out. <clears throat> uh once you've done it uh, or once i've done it yeah i kind of could could do it again and uh if somebody said hey would you ever take you know a, a trip to some you know name a country i've never been to which is maybe not terribly big i don't know uh i'd feel comfortable with it but after only because of that going into china that one that one period of six months where I was in and out of there every other month. All right. So you mentioned uh, you invested in some stocks a little bit. Um, oh. And I guess what made you interested in that to begin with? If you can think of one thing. I, I do know one thing. Okay. Um, uh, you're going to get a little more personal information than I normally share with people, but that's not terribly personal. Um, at the time when I was working over in uh, that first one hour drive commute, and I worked there for five years, we were also taking care of uh, an elderly individual in our family. And as such, we didn't, we were unable to take what I would call a real long term vacation. Weekends were okay, but no week away kind of a thing. And when I, first started working at that company, the HR people came to me and they go, okay, you know, we have these savings plans and this and that and the 401 and okay. And I, and I said, can you do you also have like a vacation or a secondary thing? And they go, oh, sure. So I was just taking $25 a week or every two weeks uh, of my paycheck to go into what we call the vacation fund. And several years into that job where we couldn't really spend any of that vacation i kind of talked to my wife one day i go hey this thing's kind of you know it's not really big but you know i've got a couple thousand bucks in here maybe i'm gonna get some stock you know we did and the first stock i ever bought i still own and it's uh it's split several different times along the years which is something that's kind of fallen out of stock favor lately so i mean you know well I, I think some stocks are uh doing that are they splitting more yeah okay like some of the big technology companies have done that recently like tesla split like a few times in the past few years like amazon google split recently so oh all right all I, right i think it's actually getting a little bit more uh popular recently well well i'm glad to hear that because i started out with 10 shares of it was Walt Disney stock and it went like four for one and three for one and different for ones and stuff. I can't even remember them all. And I've owned those stocks for over 30 years where when they come up with a dividend, it's like you're getting, a, you're getting a check. That's not, you look for it. You don't, you know, you don't go you know, check in the mail. Oh, well, here's 12 bucks. You know, hey, that's great. Now, this is like got commas in it. I mean, this is like numbers. So, I, okay. And uh, that's kind of fun. I think if I could have done it all over again, if I could go back, and I'll, I may say this a lot during the time we're talking, if I could talk to my 29 year old self with my 64 year old knowledge, I think I would have done dividend reinvest. I kept the dividends and I lived on them. I loved them. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And, uh, did I need the money? No, nah, it was fun. It was crazy, wild money. Hey, you get you know fifty bucks here, ten bucks here. You know, throw it in the pocket, have fun. Didn't really change my life at all. But dividend reinvestment. Well, it's probably have. a lot more um, difficult to do that. Like, could you reinvest your dividends if you had like less than one shares worth? Probably not. Then. Yeah, technically, I don't know if that would, if they would have allowed that. I that I don't know. At, okay. some, at some point, it got to a point where yeah. it may have, um, may have been more lucrative, you know, or even possible. But you still could have like saved up that and invested it into something I, else I once, have, once it built up. So and kind of I did a little bit. Um, those those initial ten shares that I got, I bought additional subsequent times beyond that. Um, and that's that's funny because. When I was getting into the stocks, 
I had no idea what what you're doing. It would be eons away from anything I even thought about, you know. So I was talking to the stockbroker that I uh, I'm still using, and I said, you know, wise me up. And he was a great guy, a couple years older than I, and he's still busy with the business. And he was telling me stuff. So we talk, and sometimes we call each other like right at the end of the day. And we would talk, and this was before cell phones, so we're like, you know, at home or at the office, um, you know, the five o'clock, oh, everybody go home. And I'd be at my my desk at my office here waiting for another hour drive home, talking to him. And, and it, next thing you know, it's like, oh, my God, it's 610. I got to get out of here. Um, and we would talk about this and that. He'd follow stuff like you. Um, I knew certain things in my industry with aerospace and different things at that time. And just why Disney? Um, I like it. I, I'm somewhat familiar with what they were doing at Walt Disney World and, you know, the movies and this and that. And I thought, that'd be fun to own. And it, it's been lucrative, too. Um, last couple of years, it's been a little different, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Did you um, kind of invest in, like, lots of different stocks or just kind of, like, a few and then add to those? Or what okay. was your kind of strategy there? I had I had a two prong strategy. I never named it that, but I had what I call my big. I had two portfolio kind of things that I keep track of. One I called the big stocks. Those were the Disney's and some others that I just held. And then I had the fast. I called the fast bucks. Bob's fast bucks. And I have a spreadsheet. And I printed this thing out back in the mid '90s, and it's still there. And some of these have come and gone. And uh, I would buy stuff because at that time I was doing a little more research. Hey, this has happened. International Harvester. It looks like it should be valued higher. So I buy some and then, you know, and then I it'd come back and then I'd sell it. And I remember the first time this is I felt like such a big boy when this happened. My first trip to China, I was coming back and I knew that one of the stocks I had purchased in my fast bucks was kind of on the up. And so Put on the big boy pants, and I use the phone right out of the airplane to call my stockbroker. I go, um, what the hell is that guy's name? I can't remember. No. Um, Greg, I said, what is it trading at today? He goes, da da da. I go, okay, sell it. Okay, and that that's how it's done in the stock market when you get get a thing. And I up and, and I turn to the guy next to me, and he goes, what's that all about? I go, I just made three thousand dollars for being in China for three weeks. That was fun, and that kind of thing happened a little bit. And the fast bucks one, it was it wasn't like carefree, but it was a lot looser. It wasn't my gonna retire on this you know someday thing. It was like, what's hot? Get in when it's starts to get cold get out you know move money put in different double down get out i've had them where they've gone worthless absolutely gone worthless um just cool so did you uh invest only in stocks did you have like some index funds mutual funds anything like that um not personally on my own only through 401s okay and when those come around um i've worked at so many different companies that had different ones yeah and they're handled by different management companies and whatnot uh you kind of watch for what what is prescribed for your age if you will you know more risk less risk you know yeah this and that um uh, an interesting note, in addition to all what I just talked about with stocks, and that's a stock broker. I've got another guy who's my financial advisor. We met when we were when I was six months married, and he's still my financial advisor. And uh, yeah, he helps me through these things. Hey, this is this. This one's this. This one's cap. This is you know large cap. This is you know Asian growth. This is whatever. And I don't even remember what they are. And uh, we got to the point now where we trust we trust each other enough that he gives me his best advice. I listen to like, well, I listen to all of it, and I follow like 90% of it. And sometimes I say, nah, I think I'm going to where you tell me to do. And uh, it's uh, it's been very good. Yeah, I think that's good to have people uh, that knowledgeable people that are kind of more focused on that like that's their whole job almost so 
um, you can learn from them and uh, it's a lot easier sometimes to just learn stuff from other people than learning it on your own it'll it'll come in more particularly helpful when your age is now more like my age where now I'm selling some stuff off or taking some of it out you know as a withdrawal and it's uh, if you take it from here your tax is going to be this rate and if you don't if you take it from this one and there's a Roth and then there's this other one and this one you put in under these things it's like if you don't watch it you could end up taking the same amount of money but losing a lot of more money and that's where this is where your financial guy is your hero because he will know your situation if you have him for a long time um and once you get to that level i think i'm his second oldest client this is his second longest client yeah. he got somebody a week before he got me and they're still with him um <laughs> uh so if you get somebody that you like and you like to work with and you trust hang on to him um I, i'm not going to mention his name because he's yeah. trying to retire <laughs> <laughs> uh and i don't uh, yeah i don't know i i just don't want to mention anybody's name but um um i think that's also a good a good very strong thing is to have somebody who does this knowledge for a living and uh and have your best interest at heart. I don't know if you've gotten into this yet, but when you look at mutual funds or index funds or something like this, are you watching the managers of those funds and do you have an idea of their track record and their reputation? I don't even know what you would call it. Yeah, I think that's definitely important. So I guess most of the funds I invest in are just like index funds so it's kind of just like it's very passive and it's just tracking the index so there's not really much management going on there um, okay. but there's definitely that's definitely like a good thing to look at because that's kind of a big part of how the funds going to perform like I know the um, like one specific fund from Fidelity the Magellan fund um, like uh, Peter Lynch in the 80s and 90s that was like a fantastic fund and you know like the last 20 years it ha hasn't really done that good at all and it's just because it has a different manager now so that's that's definitely a very um, important thing I think to look at and kind of consider almost like you're looking at a company and like a CEO I, I, I agree um, and it's really where my financial advisor helps me a lot. He goes, this is this fun. And he just has through his corporation, this is its five year, 10 year, 15 year numbers, you know, return, you know, growth, this, that, the other thing. And we never really talk about the managers of them, but certain ones just seem to be managed just slightly better than others and if you know who that is take advantage yeah yeah i think that's actually a pretty good point and while you were talking i kind of was thinking about this in the video you were talking about about the ceos that i made recently um i kind of tried to make the comparison almost of a ceo to like a fund manager because in sort of like a business sense a ceo is like an allocator of capital in a certain way um like allocating like shareholders capital or debt or um, like cash flow from the business, right? And in a similar way, like a fund manager is just an allocator of capital, allocating the capital of the people that are investing in their funds. So um, I think you can kind of look at it similar ways and evaluate them in similar manners. I agree. I also think with a fund manager, you have to ask yourself, well, what do these guys do all day? They don't just sit there and go, well, I'm going to manage that, you know, two billion cap thing or whatever. They've got dozens to hundreds of whatever's in this thing, and they're watching it all because if this thing looks like it's, and their experience tells them something and it's going to zig and everybody else says it's going to zag, you got to respect the, yeah, wherever they get that knowledge from, you know, uh, experience, uh, you know, watching something that's somewhat unrelated 
how it affects something else that is what you're watching. Um, much like you were talking about with the, the Home Depot stock and the house sale. I don't, you didn't think you use the word bubble, but the way that housing is kind of slowing or maybe on certain markets, it's just changing ever so much. How's that going to affect stuff? Yeah. That is where your financial advisor, in my case, my stockbroker as well, we, we, we get engrossed in conversations, you know, about, you know, how's the price of cabbage versus, you know, tire inflation. Oh, you know. Nah, it's just ludicrous, but you know, yeah. it would be something along those lines where, uh, you know, like your your house sales and, and home repair business, kind of something there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the other thing you said something about having advice for your younger self. So would you have any advice for uh, younger people these days who maybe are interested in um, business or, you know, starting a business or something like that? I do. I, I would. Um, and at each case is going to be somewhat unique. In my case, I started my business when I was in my 40s. And if I could talk to my younger self, I would say start it earlier, but not 21 out of college. Go to work where whatever your profession is. Not to say you can't start one, but go to work whatever your profession is and understand it. Do well, you know. Um, go the extra mile, if you will. Um, if you can, and it's something that you're interested in doing, improve yourself with whatever you want it to be. Sales is never wasted on people, even if they're not a salesperson. If you learn and understand that, you can understand why the sales happens when something is required and something solves that situation. Um, that can be taken in every aspect of business. And if you start a business and you said, ah, I'm going to hire salespeople, great, fantastic. But understand how it works is only going to benefit you. So I think I would have started, if I could advise myself, maybe not when I was 29, but maybe when I was 39, you know, 10 years earlier than whatever I, I started on my own. Um, you know, if there's something you feel that you can offer a solution, it's it's quite possible you could do very good at it, even if it's already being done. But you think you can do it better. And if it's already being done and it's being done poorly, well, then absolutely it can, you know, it could be something. Um, so, yes, anybody starting out now, learn your business and you know just at some point in time if you feel like you can do it step out on your own and 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 make it so we talked earlier on you know oh you don't have any boss the whole world's your boss well there's another thing that kind of goes with it too um when you own your own company there's no ceiling to what you can earn but there's no floor that's going to hold you up either yeah so helping yourself improve and however you want to improve will make that happen. Um, if you want to be a more personable person, that's going to help because we heard this all our lives. People like to do business with people that they like. And you can be a real technical, knowledgeable person, a real, you know, you know all the answers. And, and, and if you are kind of hard to be around because you're, impatient or you're blunt and it's you know maybe you need a little more polish uh consider like a dale carnegie thing wait when friends influence people um if that's not a problem then you're you're blessed man you got natural you know charisma or whatever that, those are the people that really can fly yeah uh one other thing and i, I don't want to put you on the spot so i won't ask it in a real direct way but when you do start something, give yourself a target. I want to have it, it is, is is I want to have you know my first hundred thousand dollar sale in six months, or you know my first million by the time I'm forty, 
or 30 or whatever, you know, 20. Uh, and if you think about that target, something happens and I don't understand it. You are like in tuned to getting the steps through to get it. I, I've seen it happen more than once. I, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, um, it's just an example. I, I'm taking this way out of context, so if you see it, I'm saying it wrong, It's the intent is not there. The actor Jim Carrey, he was struggling. He sat down one day and he said, I'm writing a check to myself for $1 million. I'll put it in my wallet and I'm going to cash it and I don't remember the length of time. And he did. And he went from what it was to what we now see of him. Um, so if you want to own your own company by the time you're 30, target that. Make it something that you know every day. You think about it or, you know, that's your, what am I going to do today to own my own company at 30? I'm 22. I'm 27. Okay. You know, how are you going to do that? Um, if you have a goal and you have a target, you have a better chance of hitting it than if you say, well, I want to retire when I'm 35 is a, you know, with $10 million. Well, how you can do that? Well, that's where it kind of, we don't know. But if you do, one of two things will happen. You hit it. It's like, it's kind of how I planned it. Uh, you hit it late. Okay, I didn't quite get it 35, but I got it when I was 39. Or, holy cow, this happened when I was 28. Um... Write down goals, write down, write down targets, write down dates and, you know, pursue it. Did you do that like in your business and, or, I mean, did you have more abstract goals maybe or? They were a bit more abstract. Okay. Is as generic as I just want job security. Okay. There will be years I won't get any pay, but there will be years where I will make up for it. And it all happened that way. Um, and. It, it it came out because I didn't quit. I didn't want it when it and it was there were two years in particular. It was very very tough, where I wasn't certain if I was going to be able to pay my rent on the building that I had. Well, I got through it. Got through it sometimes pretty snug. You know, it was it was snug, um, but then. Things started happening, and I kept pushing, and I kept driving it. And uh, when it started becoming more organic, that whole part of that equation kind of went away of worrying if I'm going to pay something. Now it was how best to drive this forward, with, with, knowing with my limitations as being a one-man show kind of, you know. So I heard one other... I wish I could remember the site, the places, all these. I've got boxes of books that I've read and tapes that I've listened to. And one of the best ways somebody describes starting off your own business and starting off your your personal thing, it's like getting into an airplane and getting it to fly, getting the business to be successful. And the analogy they said is when you get on an airplane and you're on the end of that tarmac you give that thing a hundred percent of the throttle and you get that thing going down that thing as fast as you can and right when you're getting towards the end of that runway you're going to lift that thing off and if you do it right you're going to climb he goes and that's when you really really got to give it a hundred percent because you want to get that thing up to cruising altitude and once you get there you can back off the throttle and then you can cruise for a long time. That's how it is in business. Um, it was certainly that way for me, where I gave it as much as I could and through some tough times and everything else, when it finally got off and I was really pushing, really going, I knew I was up at cruising altitude when I could bring in other uh, people to work for me, to help me uh, take care of the shipping and the bill paying and the, this kind of a thing. Uh, if you hold back at that first portion of that airplane going down that runway, you'll never get off the ground. Yeah, that makes sense. What was your, uh, 
did you did you have like debt initially in the business um at all um uh not not like a loan per se okay. uh when i first started out myself and my partner we each put in a substantial amount of capital we okay. just we we he had some i had some we put it in there and okay what are we going to do with this well part, part of that's going to be you know we got to rent a place furnish the place get telephones and everything like that uh company car because we were going to be hauling all over the place doing this that and the other thing what wasn't in there was pay it made no sense for each of us to put in you know x numbers of thousands of dollars and then at the first end of the week start taking our paychecks yeah that's when that that airplane throttle goes back to half throttle and it would have never gotten off the ground um so yeah it was lean we lived lean um i think i think i could have got it more lucrative much quicker um with something we talked about earlier marketing um I had so much money to make people understand and know how to get to us. And I was a little bit tight, quite a bit tight, when it came time to advertising. Um, we would go to the trade shows, which was a considerable amount of money. Uh, the uh, principal who I was selling for ponied up half of it, which made it a lot nicer. Um, but I did not understand advertising as i now later have as far as why do you see advertisements for coca-cola we, we all know what it is yet you still see a billboard here or an advertisement in a magazine here and some time ago i somebody either told me this or i figured it out they go advertising serves many purposes when it's a young company that you're starting out it's saying here i am you don't know about me, but this is what we can do. Later on, it's going to be, I'm still around. I mean, Coca-Cola, they don't need to tell people that, you know, to drink Coca-Cola, but you still see advertising. Um, it's not being taken away. And you might be kind of young to remember this, but there was a point in time where Coca-Cola was taking it away. They changed their formula for some reason, and it can't, kind of went back. Um it, it was shocking, you know, so. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't, hadn't thought about that, like some well, example like that, but that well, makes sense. I'll leave you this with this last thing, maybe. I don't know um, where I got this from again. I, I've got volumes of stuff. When you're a, in a sales situation and you're going to sell something to somebody, in my case, it was a, a fairly large piece of machinery you want to know who is the decision maker at the company that you're selling it to. It's the best if you can deal directly with them. So oftentimes you cannot. Well, here's the problem. If, you can, if you're talking to somebody and that guy is going to make a decision between yours and yours and yours, these three different machines, he's got to learn something and talk to the decision maker. And there are a couple of things that you tell them that they will always, always remember. One is the price. So if you got this, A is this price, B is and C are these two prices, he will tell the decision maker that. Beyond that, you're hoping that you told them enough of the savvy stuff that he can tell you, well, why is A different than B or C? And so the way somebody put it to me once is, if you're not dealing with the decision maker, you got to sell this thing, not so that this person you're talking to can buy it, but so that they can sell it because you don't have the right audience. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you find yourself dealing a lot with, I guess, not the decision maker? Um, it, yeah, a lot, okay. a lot. Um, because of what I sell, uh, what I had sold, um, this equipment, $80,000 to $750,000, that kind of money usually gets the attention of the decision maker 
if not immediately, at least before the conclusion of the sale. Um, one of the things that was a thing to learn when I was making those early initial sales over into China, you would go into a room and you'd see the same group of people for three weeks and they're all taking notes. They're all one or two people are asking the questions and you are really at the mercy of people who know who your audience is. And in that case, our agent would tell me, see that lady over there? She's the one who's going to call the shots. She wouldn't say a darn thing, or maybe she would. Um, and so it got to be kind of interesting, certainly multicultural, where your presentation was going on and you're not looking for her to ask you anything. But if she started to perk up, you knew you were onto something. And if she started to like, you know, busy herself with something else or, you know, whatever, you're like, oh, I'm losing my audience. Um, Again, self-help books on reading body language, extremely helpful, really, really helpful. We were in a sales presentation. We were in the middle of a three-week thing in China, and it was often where you would stay in a you'd stay in the same hotel for three weeks, and you'd take a cab to whatever this business was, or if they had an off-site thing, you'd go to there. And you'd be dealing with the same people all the time. Well, we got into the cab one time. And the, in China, there could be a driving wheel on the left side or on the right side of the car. They, they kind of drove like we do here in, in North America. But it was not uncommon for them to get secondhand cars out of Europe. And that's just how it was. And so the driver was up in the front right driving the car. My agent was up in the front left where you would expect to be driving, but, you know, no. I'm in the back seat, and my agent's son is in the back seat behind him. And the cab is driving through these streets of China. It's already very congested, and they're honking their horn, like, almost consistently, nonstop. And we ask, excuse me, why is this guy constantly honking his horn? And uh, apparently the law at the time, whether it's still there or not, is... If you hit a pedestrian, but you were honking, it's their fault. If you don't honk, <laughs> you should have honked to warn them to get the hell out or whatever. Okay. So we're he's honking his car. And it's the traffic circles there are very different than the traffic circles here. First of all, there is no circle. It's just a round paved area where any number of roads could come into this thing. And you can see pedestrians bicycles, livestock, livestock carts, trucks. All you got to do is just keep moving. And the people driving all understand this. So if you're coming in the circle and you want to go out here, you might go here to go all the way around all kinds of stuff and you'll get through there amazingly efficiently. It's scary as heck. I mean, you don't know you're passing a truck who's passing an ox cart who's passing a pedestrian and you don't know if the oncoming truck's going to get out or whatnot. You finally get out of this whole thing and we're going down a less traveled road. It's a toll road and we pull up and the toll is actually on the side where we'd see it in North America. And so my agent's sitting there and the driver's over here and the window had a gap this high at the top and the crank, the hand crank was missing. And so we pull up to the uh, turn cell or whatever, the, the toll booth, and he had to get a ticket or pay something. And they're talking back and forth in Mandarin. And he goes, how do I get this window down? And he goes, oh, just stick your hands in there and pull it down. And like a ratchet, <clears throat> it, it comes down. Oh, okay. Pays the money or gets the tab. How does it go back up? Same thing in reverse. <clears throat> Okay, you need enough room to pull your, your fingers out of there. We're driving down the road, and both windows have a finger gap at the top and the front, and the air is twirling around over the head. And the cab drivers live in these cabs often, and there was a roll of toilet paper that was sitting on the back shelf, and the wind was kind of making it unroll a little bit, and it was kind of fluttering. And it was tickling the ear of my agent's son. And he goes, hmm? oh, he just rolls it back up, tucks it back up there. And, you know, further down, you know, unrolls again. I go, 
what's what's that for? He goes, uh, I don't know. I go, okay. So now we're cranking down the road, and the damn hood flies up off the thing, pinned against the windshield. The guy does not take his foot off the accelerator. He hunches down and look at this little gap over the top of the thing. <laughs> And my agent's going crazy. He goes, hey, 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 stop. And the guy goes, I can drive like this. I go, I know what that's for. I need some. <laughs> that's funny. It's a crazy story. Uh, just funny stories when you're over there, too. Just It's just lovely country. I love China. Have you been over there anytime recently? Um, right, a year before, uh, six months before I retired, I went back to Shanghai and uh very very nice city if you if you've ever been there i don't think you have but um it's uh it's got a river and there's an old section on one side and a new section on the other and uh it, it's it's nice it really is have you noticed like a lot of change or have you been able to notice like anything different since you oh, oh yeah there? oh yeah from the 1995 to 2014 or 15 or 18, I guess, is when I did my last trip over there. Um, it changed considerably in the places I have been. Um, becoming, I'll say, more Western, not in everything, but a lot more people have more money. They're, they're dr driving fancier cars or, or cars to begin with uh shopping areas building is up um it's really it's really advancing quite quite nicely yeah i it uh it changed a lot from the set the 95 time when i first started going there uh till uh 2018. i guess do you have any questions for me um well i do i guess um what are your goals as far as however you want to measure success for yourself well i think um at this point uh the next thing for me is just to get through college and get on to an actual job i mean i'm probably just gonna get like a standard engineering job you know but um, at this point my main goal is to at least have the ability to do what i want by the age of 35. now whether that means like quitting work i have no idea but um, the, I guess the main problem with that at this point is, like you said, I don't really have like much of a plan to get there. And, um, I just don't really know what my life is going to be like to be able to plan for it at this point, I think is my major issue. Um, but I, I think I'm trying to, uh, prepare myself for that, but I don't really know what it's going to look like. If that makes sense. Okay, um, am I correct in thinking, remembering your sophomore in college? Uh, yeah, I just finished my second year. Okay, so, so, so you'd be in, jumping into your, your junior year. Yeah, about. Um, so you've got two more years then, uh, uh, primarily. Uh, it's, it's very interesting how things happen because they'll be recruiting fairs and all this and that, and you'll be hearing this and that, and people will tell you all these options and this and that. Um, what you get presented and what you accept is going to be a pretty major direction in how from the age of 23 to 35 goes. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting. Um, uh, I think the biggest thing that, benefited me for that first job was the fact that the bearing industry was every industry anything that had power transmission or rotation or that kind of a thing opened my eyes to all kinds of stuff yeah i mean i guess software is similar like there's so much opportunity there and yeah like it's needed everywhere so kind of have uh so that software is, is going to be kind of the yeah something. engineering side of it that you're yeah software gonna... engineering computer okay. engineering something like that okay. i mean my degree is computer engineering so, oh okay um, um something some sort of okay like that well 
Um, I think you're in an extremely exciting age with technology. What's happening now wasn't even around when I started my company. I have no idea what's coming next, but you're going to be out on the edge of it, and you're going to marry this with that and say, hey, we can have it tied in with this and stuff we just didn't even know possible yeah. is going to be your your day-to-day -day. yeah hopefully that'll be exciting it will be that would be real exciting all right well uh thank you for okay. taking your time to okay. talk to us and uh i really enjoyed it and you're um, welcome hopefully everyone else enjoyed it as well thank you